this is about the game theoretic aspects of uh, blockchain protocol, which uh, um, are extremely important. When you analyze a protocol, you can think of um, different parties acting in a good versus bad or bad versus good. So the adversary would like to subvert the honest parties. So you can uh, think of them in this way. And in some sense, this is the classic cryptographic setting. Um, on the other hand, the, the way things work in the world is, is not so black and white, if you want. There is like rational actors that uh, basically participate in the protocol and um, they may have a, an incentive to deviate from the way the protocol operates. So while Bitcoin has proven to be quite resilient, we know that from an incentive point of view, is the protocol does not work well and it's uh, actually possible like to deviate from the protocol and uh, get an advantage against uh, players that actually do follow the protocol. So proving that following the protocol is an equilibrium from a rational point of view, uh, this is something that touches on, on game theory and um, when you have a complex game between rational participants, a Nash equilibrium is a strategy for participants that says, if I know that you follow the equilibrium strategy, it doesn't make sense for me to deviate from that strategy. One of the um, major updates and something that uh, uh, I included in my presentation uh, today here at Oxford about Ouroboros was um, our proof that the protocol is an approximate Nash equilibrium, which basically states that parties um, are the incentive structure that the protocol provides suggests that uh, parties have gained no advantage by deviating uh, from the honest protocol strategy. So if you have a malicious coalition that uh, would like to change the way that uh, the protocol operates in their own machines, they will not gain a substantial advantage compared to uh, the other parties that actually follow the protocol. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here for the crypto seminar. It's a um, great pleasure to be here and uh, present to you Ouroboros. Uh, this is a proof of stake uh, blockchain protocol um, that uh, um, I will describe to you and uh, its properties. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions uh, during the talk. We can do it uh, this quite interactively. Um, so I'm going to start with a uh, general discussion about Bitcoin blockchain systems and what do they try to achieve and what is the motivation for um, building a proof of stake system. So, well, you all know Bitcoin um, and like many people have said, is a remarkable solution. So the question I like to ask is, what is the problem that it solves? So this is one of these like interesting settings that uh, you have in, in crypto and, and uh, distributed system theory where you have a protocol which is very successful and um, when it was introduced, it was introduced outside the usual cycle of scientific research where problems are posed, and solutions are given and analyzed. Instead, what we had was a uh, protocol which was launched in the form of an, impl an actual implementation um, in early 2009 and since then it became immensely successful. So understanding it from a computer science research point of view um, is a very fascinating uh, question that also inspired me um, early on in, uh, um, in this domain. So it's important to distinguish from the point of view of uh, um, CS theory, protocol solutions like what is the Bitcoin protocol and the objectives that they try to meet. And it's very important to understand these objectives because only then we're able to reevaluate uh, whether the specific solutions we have, like the Bitcoin system, for instance, is um, the ones that are best fit for the objective. So. What you may call the objective that Bitcoin tries to solve is the notion of a robust transaction ledger, which is something that uh, we have investigated formally 
in previous work, which I'll say a few words about. So once you have completely understood the objectives, then you can go and ask questions about whether the specific protocol design is best. And exploring this protocol design space with protocols and assumptions under which the protocols meet the objectives is uh, what propels uh, research in cryptography, but also in general in computer science. So the analysis of the first analysis of the Bitcoin from this point of view uh, was conducted in this uh, previous research, which was joined with Juan Garay and Nicos Leonardos, which we call it analyzing the Bitcoin backbone protocol. Um, the intention there was to extract the main features of the Bitcoin system, abstract away things that were not relevant to a first analysis, and present in the form of pseudocode in an algorithmic way, in a way that it's possible to describe in a handful of pages how the protocol works, while keeping all the important features that um, would be relevant for a proper analysis. And now you compare to that, like, what is the objective? So in that paper, we also gave a specific objective that um, it seemed the protocol was trying to solve. And that is building a transaction ledger in the presence of an adversary that tries to subvert two basic properties. So these were called persistence and liveness, and I will say a few words about them uh, in the coming slides. So what we provided in that work was a proof that in a static setting, it is possible to demonstrate that this protocol actually meets the uh, objective of a robust transaction ledger under certain assumptions. And these assumptions in the paper were involving a concept related to proof of work, and more specifically, the random oracle model, which was the main tool to obtain the properties of the proof of work that were necessary for the proof to go through. Um, so this analysis is not the end. On the contrary, it's actually the beginning. Because once you have something like that, you can start asking questions like the one that you see, for example, on the upper right. Given now that we have an objective, and that objective is met by the specific protocol, is that protocol the best way to solve it while maintaining the basic properties? So this is the same question that you can ask so many, so many other cases when you are in computer science or in cryptography theory. So if the objective is sorting, is your sorting algorithm the best way to do it? If your objective is a digital signature, is that specific digital signature the best way to do it? So now you can ask the same question here. If the objective is a robust transaction ledger, is the Bitcoin protocol the best way to solve it? And answering what is best, it has to take many things into account. So one, especially because we are in a security setting, one thing to ask is performance. And that's like the most straightforward. Like we would like the, to have the most efficient solution. And the other thing, especially because we are in a security setting, is to ask, are the assumptions under which the protocol meets the objective the ones that are the most realistic in practice? That's the second important point. So um, the design challenges for uh, finding alternative protocols, uh, they have this performance dimension. So Bitcoin is slow and we would like to see whether it's possible to get a faster protocol. It's worth pointing out that if you compare it in net transaction processing time, transaction per second of Visa, <coughs> it's at least 2,000, PayPal, 100. By various measurements, Bitcoin is far less than that. Clearly not something that could scale um, at the global level as is the intended application domain for Bitcoin. Um, energy also is very high. And this actually comes from the other dimension uh, that 
is related to Bitcoin operations. So Bitcoin relies on proof of work as its core assumption, if you want, as, as one of its core cryptographic components. And it's reasonable to ask whether it is necessary to achieve this level of decentralization that Bitcoin has. To some degree, it seems like it's quite important, but that's something that has to be challenged if we are to explore this design space. So, given that our objective is to have a robust transaction ledger, let's focus a little bit and understand what is that objective. So, as I mentioned, there are two properties that we're interested in, persistence and liveness. So, persistence refers, and this is like a high level uh, description of the property, that basically transactions are recorded in the ledger and when they are confirmed by one node, because that's a decentralized system, so there are many nodes that are implementing that ledger, so if you hear from a node that a certain transaction is confirmed, you will not, this transaction has been stabilized in the ledger and when this transaction is confirmed by another node, there won't be disagreement about how it has been stabilized. And stabilized here means that it has been given a specific position in the lifetime of the system. And therefore, once it's confirmed, all the nodes will confirm it in the same way. Um, so persistence is just one side of the coin. Uh, question. Just to get my intuition right, confirmed here in the Bitcoin protocol, which can you wait for 10 transactions block to go through and then confirm to use as another 10 blocks after that? Right. So yeah, confirmed here is, more generally you can think of it as a certain predicate that examines the blockchain as reported by one of the nodes with respect to a certain transaction and says, I feel safe that this transaction is it's fine, but in the case of Bitcoin, it's exactly the way you said. So the transaction has a number of blocks on top of it. Um, so persistence is only one side of a coin because it says if one, if one node confirms, then the others will not disagree. You can think of it as a basic safety property in the language of distributed systems, um, but it's not a liveness property. It doesn't say that eventually the system will confirm anything. It says if it confirms, then there's no disagreement about you know, what is confirmed. Um, so we want also to make sure that eventually the system confirms transactions which are reported, and that's what is captured by liveness. So, so this is the objective, and now that we have this as an objective, the question is how do we make this, how do we implement something like that? So Bitcoin does that implementation, but we can try to achieve something similar in different ways. So what is a design space? There's many choices. So to begin with, we can also examine a completely centralized solution. And, th and then you can think like the problem becomes quite trivial. Like we have a database, it's one server, records transactions as they appear, it tells you they are confirmed simple. So you can think of all the solutions in this two-dimensional space where the centralization like goes to the right and performance energy efficiently goes to the top. So it's straightforward that if you have a centralized database that's basically as efficient you might hope you can be. Like there's only one node, there's nothing to disagree, there's nothing you know to communicate, this is going to be the maximum throughput that you can get. Of course, you can parallelize it, you can do like many things to it, but it's a single point, basically. So that's like quite high on this dimension, and clearly it's, well, very low on the decentralization dimension. You know, there's no decentralization at all. So then there's a very vast class of protocols that you can think that you can use here, and these are these Byzantine Agreement protocols that um, there is a very extensive literature in distributed systems uh, that uh, studies that problem. So the business agreement literature has protocols that operate typically under the following conditions. You have a set of nodes 
which either they have authenticated channels with each other or they belong to a, an identity infrastructure, so there is a PKI. They can issue signatures and they can communicate with each other either via broadcast or point-to-point -point channels. So you can think of this as a static decentralized setting. Set of nodes sending messages to each other with the objective to reach um, consensus about, let's say, what happened. Um, and you can certainly solve that robust transaction ledger using a series of Byzantine agreement instances uh, for the transactions that are emitted by the users of the system. Clearly, this is more decentralized than having a centralized database. And, well, it's also less efficient. <coughs> These protocols, they do require some substantial effort in order to produce a unique view among the servers. Because, and this have to be stressed here, these protocols are assumed to operate in the presence of an adversary that tries to subvert the joint view of uh, the servers. Now, where does Bitcoin fit in that? Well, Bitcoin is very decentralized in the sense that it does not even require an identity infrastructure of any kind. So anyone can be a node of the Bitcoin system as long as they open their computer and download the client. So the only thing that they have to agree is on an in initial starting position, the genesis block, and once they have this initial starting position, they can start contributing to the system without any introduction or, sub or help or, or joining procedure to the system. So it's a completely open system, very decentralized, therefore, but not efficient, not good in the performance direction. So what's interesting here is to ask, like, what is there in the upper right corner, if anything at all? Is it feasible to get something which approximates the performance that you would get from, let's say, business in agreement or centralized databases, but is as decentralized as, as Bitcoin, or at least close to being as decentralized? So this is the motivation. And exploring this design space is one of the very interesting open questions um, in the greater blockchain uh, in the greater blockchain uh, research area. So this motivates proof of stake. Proof of stake is a class of consensus protocol, consensus protocols that attempt to fit exactly in this uh, design space territory, uh, which had the question mark in the previous slide. So how to understand how proof of stake works? So generating the next block in Bitcoin is like an election so you can think that the way Bitcoin works, there is basically a lottery in one of the entities that are running the protocol is elected to issue the block with a probability which is proportional to its hashing power. <coughs> because it is decentralized, collisions may happen, but that's why the way the Bitcoin system works is that it obeys a longest chain rule, where longest here is to be interpreted in a, um, in a broad way. So what is longest might actually be different depending on how you instantiate, how you analyze this. Um, but essentially there is a way to select the best chain out of those that are available and having this chain selection rule enables parties to converge to one unique joint history. So with this as a starting point, if Bitcoin, what it does is essentially a randomized election for picking the next candidate that is eligible to produce a block, maybe we can do it differently if that's the logic. So here is how proof of stake, the main idea behind proof of stake. Instead of actually thinking of hashing power, how about we just use the amount of stake that a certain stakeholder has 
as it is reported in the blockchain itself. Here, this uses the observation that hashing power is something that you would buy with money. And now let's assume that all the money there is is what you have in the blockchain itself. So therefore, we can, quote unquote, cut the middleman, cut the middle entity here, and just re directly refer to the amount of stake that you have in the system as it is reported in the blockchain itself. So instead of thinking of the entities that are in the protocol as the miners, these are the stakeholders which are reported in the, in the ledger. And then now we need a randomized process that will take the current stake and elect the next miner, which is able to produce a block. So basically, if you put it in this point of view, proof of stake is quite decentralized. It's more decentralized than business and agreement protocols because it allows the set of stakeholders responsible for running the protocol to shift arbitrarily as the system evolves. So this is not a static system. It's a system that when it starts from a certain point, it might, this initial point might lead to other states and eventually the set of nodes that share the responsibility uh, for running the protocol can be completely disjoint to the set of nodes that started the system. <coughs> and furthermore, it has the capability, at least in theory, to be vastly more efficient than what Bitcoin is. Because there is absolutely no need to employ proof of work in order to perform this procedure. You can invoke standard cryptographic tools to perform that leader election process, at least again in principle. So the network can actually run at the maximum synchronization speed that can be allowed. Whereas in the case of Bitcoin, <coughs> it is clear that the role of proof of work interacts with the network synchronization speed and should be sufficiently hard to enable the parties to synchronize um, their joint views. So at least that's the hope. And based on these hopes, since as early as 2011, an array of systems were proposed in the same tradition as Bitcoin that attempted to take the ideas I just mentioned and implement them into something that works. And there is a number of blockchain systems that are based on proof of stake, and I cite here a few of them, that used essentially the same ideas. Peercoin and Next are two examples which uh, were quite prominent. And the concept was that you have an eligibility function that determines the next stakeholder to issue a block. And this is uh, <coughs> uh, what is uh, based on uh, the current view that every stakeholder has. And then the level of st or stake the stakeholder possesses will calibrate the eligibility threshold. So if you have a higher stake, uh, you have a higher probability of being eligible for issuing the next block. And that, in a sense, would parallel the way Bitcoin works. If you have more hashing power, you're more likely to be the one that will issue the next block. <coughs> so there were very few principled approach of, of how to design it. Um, one which is worth mentioning is by Bentov, Gabizon, and Mizrahi, who identified the issue in previous solutions that the random selection process is something that can be subject to attack. And having a way to do this without bias should be an important design consideration. They suggested using collective coin flipping uh, to do that without actually providing uh, though a um, security analysis of their solution. So the current state of things that motivated our work in this protocol, which I will be presenting to you today, was that while there were many interesting ideas about how proof of stake protocols should be designed, 
we had a big array of attacks that were identified by the community. And it was very unclear um, how could a protocol withstand those attacks and provide a proper transaction ledger. Some of the attacks that were considered are the ones that you see in this slide. An example, the first example is what was called a grinding attack, where basically a malicious stakeholder tries to, ahead of time, try many different ways to finish the head of the chain that it has so that it gets an advantage. This gener generalizes to what is being called the nothing at stake attack, where contrary to Bitcoin in the proof of stake, in principle, there seems to be nothing to prevent a set of malicious stakeholders to try all possible histories that the a protocol might um, follow while it executes. And they can, in principle, vote in all of them since they have nothing really to lose by voting in all of them. Contrast to Bitcoin, where hashing power cannot be used in two different chains, exactly because you can only apply your computational power either to one or the other, so an attacker will have to choose which chain to follow. And then you can have circularity problems that occur even in the case coin flipping is used. And the issue here is if you want to generate fresh randomness, you have to have agreement between the participants. But if you are going to use the blockchain itself for agreement, this creates a circularity problem. You're using randomness to generate a blockchain, but then the blockchain itself relies on this randomness for its security. So how can you resolve like this circularity argument between the coin flipping procedure, the procedure that injects randomness, and the blockchain that itself is being built based on that randomness. So this is the state of affairs uh, that uh, motivated um, our design. And I'll tell you a little bit about what is our contributions um, in a high level, and then we can come to specific details. So first of all, it's a formalization of what is the proof of stake design challenge. Then a construction, which is Ouroboros, uh, uh, the proof of stake protocol that we have designed, which we designed it contrary to what um, was followed before, together with a proof of security that it satisfies the properties of a robust transaction ledger in a proper model. And one important aspect of the proof strategy that we have is that agreement is shown to hold for a small initial segment of the system operation, which then becomes, which then is violated if you let it advance. But then we can show that we can use this short period of agreement to bootstrap a secure multi-party computation protocol that can produce unbiased randomness and thus can see the next segment of the protocol operation. So this creates a bootstrapping opportunity that can take a short agreement opportunity, which is analyzed independently in a combinatorial sense, as I will show you, and then you can extend that to an arbitrary amount of time by using cryptographic techniques from secure multi-party computation. So this is the general design strategy and this kind of circularity that exists in this design strategy and proof is also what gave uh, the name uh, of the protocol, which you might be aware of this Ouroboros is the snake that eats its tail and it represents this circular motion that is reflected in the design and proof strategy of the protocol. So let's see a little bit how the protocol works in more detail. So that's the static stake setting. 
It's that very short initial segment which I mentioned. So this is how the first <coughs> um, this is how the first small period of operation that you will see in an Ouroboros instance the moment the protocol starts. So the protocol assumes that there is an initial set of stakeholders and an initial string of randomness which is assumed honest. So this is like an, an initial assumption about the system which is given for free. So that's, if you want, the genesis block. And you can think of this as a common reference point that all clients have. <coughs> Using this initial randomness, there is a deterministic process that can take the randomness and determine a sequence of stakeholders weighted by stake that will be responsible for time intervals identified as slots in that initial segment. So what you see here is slots, which are defined as denoted by this um, E value for um, an opportunity where an election took place and that is the election leader which is assigned to that. So we're going to have one stakeholder responsible for each one of those slots. Now this is the stakeholder that will be responsible for issuing a block during that slot and that's a stakeholder that will be responsible for issuing a block on that slot. Issuing a block means basically signing a set of transactions or signing the contents of the block. As we will see, since this, what is the contents of the block is a bit more nuanced. Um, otherwise, the protocol will advance like a regular blockchain. In other words, the contents of that block will contain a hash of the previous block and so forth. Issuing a block in a certain slot is not something which is mandatory or necessary for the protocol to advance. Slots <coughs> have a specific deadline and once they have passed the protocol will move on. So that means that you can have empty slots like these. The actual time window that is represented by every slot should be sufficiently long so that the majority of the network can synchronize with each other and can only be experimentally determined. We have done this actual experimental uh, investigation of what is the right length of a slot using an Amazon Cloud deployment of an implementation of Ouroboros, which I'll say a few words at the end. And the slot uh, configuration that worked um, in a geographically diverse uh, deployment was 20 seconds. So 20 seconds was enabling the overwhelming majority of stakeholders to actually converge and to actually have uh, a message transmitted to each other. So that's like the round time that you need for node one to send a message to node two. For example, like one of the nodes is in Brazil, the other node uh, is in Germany, and there was another node in uh, Japan and another node in the uh, uh, United States, and 20 seconds was sufficient time for them to synchronize <coughs> with each other. So, you have blocks produced, one block in every slot. They contain inputs that are determined for that block. And some of the stakeholders are not present. So what's important to point out is that every stakeholder is elected using the seed which is available in the Genesis block proportional to the stake. So let's say if there is a stakeholder that has 100% of the stake, he will be the only one which is present and selected as leader. <coughs> the more diverse is the stakeholder distribution, the better it is uh, for the diversity of uh, entities that uh, are responsible for every slot. Okay, so now let's come to see what we want to prove about that. And again, I stress that in this first analysis that I say in the first part of the description <coughs> of the security proof, the... Um, Intention is that we're going to analyze a very short segment of the system operation. Then we're going to apply this bootstrapping idea using secure multipart computation, which I'll come to it afterwards. So let's analyze then the initial segment. What kind of properties do we want for this blockchain 
that the stakeholders are building. So first we want the common prefix property, which you see described here. For any two rounds and two honest parties that have changed C1, C2 respectively, it should hold that if you remove K blocks from the change C1, you will find yourself in a prefix of C2. So this, is a, this common prefix property is a fundamental agreement property that you would like to have from this data structure. Essentially, that means that what the honest players build is a chain which has a big common trunk and potentially some orphaned <coughs> twigs that are like going left and right as this like common trunk like grows. So this is captured by this common prefix uh, property. Now common prefix doesn't tell you anything about what are the contents of that, of that chain. So this is provided by this chain quality property that says if you take um, the proportion of blocks in any k long subsequence, the blocks that are produced by the adversary should be less than mu times k, where mu here should be a, some uh, fraction that shows how many blocks were produced by an adversary uh, in any k long segment of an honest party's chain. Finally, chain growth, which has the coefficient tau, it says if you look at the chain of an honest party and you look at it at two different moments of time, it has grown in terms of length by a certain amount, which is this chain growth coefficient, we call it tau. So we will show that a robust transaction ledger is something that reduced to this basic properties. If you want like double spending or something like that, it will be eventually, as we will show, something to be prevented by the combination of those properties. So for example, double spending would be violating a common prefix type of, type of attack. So it will be a common prefix attack. So that double spending basically means that the honest parties of the system believed a certain chain at a certain moment, but suddenly like at another moment when you ask them, they believe something else and a certain transaction has disappeared that they believed. If that transaction is more than k blocks deep in the ledger that has disappeared, that would be in violation of this, uh, common, of this prefix condition here, right? Because you would have something that you removed k blocks from it and, and it's not in the prefix of C2, right? So, so basically here, any type of attack that you can think of against like the ledger aspect can be reduced to an attack against uh, one of those three properties or a combination of those properties. <coughs> All right, so um, let's look a little bit about the common prefix property and the question is like, will the honest players converge? Um, so convergence um, in the common prefix setting can be actually reduced in this initial segment can be reduced to a combinatorial question. So, and if you have completely phased out in the first part of this talk, you can just like focus back in and just think about this combinatorial question. It's a clean cut question which you can think about it completely independently of whatever I was talking before, stake, Bitcoin, or, or anything. It's just a question about strings and things that, and a certain combinatorial structure that you have to build for those strings. So let's understand a little bit like just this issue. So take a string, let's say this one, <coughs> and think of a tree that you can build on it that obeys to the following, in the following way. If you have a zero, like these positions, these are the honest stakeholder slots, referring to the previous uh, discussion. So this is where blocks were issued by the honest stakeholders as the protocol was executing. So for example, like this guy created that block, and that guy, number five, created that block, etc. Once, are the ones are the positions that correspond to the malicious stakeholders. 
they can do whatever they want. They can like extend different chains and they can create forks, so they can do whatever they want. They have absolutely no obligation to follow the protocol. And furthermore, contrary to Bitcoin, they don't even have to um, invest effort to do expand this uh, part of the chain or another. <clears throat> so they can create things like that. For example, they can sign two blocks here. They can extend uh, this chain or they can extend that chain. Um, so here you see an example of a possible protocol run that depends on that specific string that corresponds to the slot sequence as it is divided between honest stakeholders for zero and malicious stakeholders for one. So what happened was, first of all, like this stakeholder produced this block, one, which is honest. Then this guy, malicious, he came, he created a fork extending this block and also this block. Then this guy delivered that part to this guy. So this guy extended this one. This guy had no clue about this one. Then another malicious, he extended both of those. He delivered this one to this honest guy who naively just produced this one. He didn't know anything about the rest and so forth. The, only, the basic thing you assume is that as the honest parties operate, they follow the longest chain rule because this is how our protocol works. So in, in particular, <coughs> this honest stakeholder could not have extended <coughs> this particular chain or because he prefers the one that has the longest blocks. So he chose this one. So this is up to the delivery that is performed by the malicious parties and so forth. So the question now that arises is the following. If I give you a certain string like this, is it possible to finish that string in a situation where a fork as wide as the string exists? That's the combinatorial question. So we call such strings forkable strings. So these are the bad strings. So whenever a string is forkable, appears in the sequence of leader elections, we have a forking opportunity. On the other hand, if no such forking is feasible, the fork would collapse and it was going to be only a single long chain that can appear in the sequence of those slots. So is that um, clear, at least at an intuitive level? Any question that you'd like to ask? Yeah, Ali. Yes. So for the fifth one, for number five, was he aware of the other well, branches that? I mean, why, why, why didn't he take the, the one in the middle? Yes. Good, good question. The, the thing is that because the one in the middle, <coughs> it's, um, it's longer indeed, but <coughs> it has only adversarial blocks up to here. So it's strategically up to the adversary whether it wants to reveal it at that moment. So therefore, this chain, you can think of it not necessarily as long as up to here, but here or there. So it's feasible for the adversary to convince this person to sign here because... So he would reveal one of them. Yes, exactly. He would reveal just one of them. On the other hand, he has to reveal this one because this was issued by an honest party. So in other words, this guy when he was here, he would see this one because that was emitted by an honest party and, and this one. So he would just see and maybe a portion of this one at the discretion of the adversary. But let's say the adversary here prefers not to use that. So he doesn't, he hides it. But he, he could have chosen the, uh, the other he one. He could have chosen this one. But the way we model uh, our security models um, thinks of the adversary in a rushing mode, so he has full control of the network, so he can deliver um, chains in the order that it prefers. That only makes him stronger. So in this case, he prefers to deliver this one, this chain first to this stakeholder, so he will choose this one as opposed to that one. 
you can make a weaker model, or let's say you can flip a coin between those two, but that would just make the adversary weaker, and it's unclear whether you know, practice would actually support that. Yes, longer means number of blocks. And if they're equal, we just let the adversary choose whichever it prefers. So that gives to him only bigger power. Yeah? Yes, exactly. So the only thing that the adversary cannot prevent um, is whether there is like a chain like that, which has an honest party, so this one will have to be transmitted. So he cannot stifle that chain. So if that chain had three blocks, let's say, it would be infeasible, so this number five would actually go there. Yeah, okay. the like yeah, yes, exactly, but, but that would depend on wh whether he has a one, like, so it really depends on the string. So if it has zeros, yeah, so each one of, it's one is one block, yeah. So, so then, so, so this is a pure combinatorial question in the sense like I give you a string, what's the, more, what's the most complicated such tree structure you can make? That's the question. And specifically, an, a forkable string will have the property of en enjoying, quote unquote, two forks throughout the whole length, whereas a string that has no fork it will have a single longest path. That's what we prefer, right? A single longest path is what we prefer. So for instance, if you take 0, 0, 0, 0, no ones at all, it's just only one path. Is and regardless of whether the, the ending nodes on, in that path are actually um, uh, take ones or, or, or leave ones? You know? No, I, I just said all zeros, let's say. So if it's all zeros, like no malicious stakeholders, then it's just one chain. I mean, that's, well, that's very unlikely, let's say, obviously. On the other hand, if you take a string that has humming weight um, or humming ratio, let's say, 50% or more, like it has more ones than zeros, um, or actually equal, one, equal ones and zeros, then you can easily see that you can fork it in a very, in a very straightforward manner. So essentially, the adversary can be completely silent up until the end, and then suddenly, boom, get an equally long other chain. But this is not bad, right? So in a sense, we were expecting that. So we were expecting that the moment we're going to hit 50%, when the moment the adversary controls 50% of the stake, which will reflect, which will translate probabilistically to a 50% humming uh, ratio string, we're going to lose security. So on the other hand, um, the all zero case, it works for us, we knew that as well, but it won't happen, right? So we would like to examine the situation where some of the stakeholders are malicious, and we're interested, of course, in the case where the stakeholders are below, strictly below 50%. So this becomes like a nice combinatorial um, question which, which we have completely investigated. And uh, you can prove like, first, an easy, uh, statement, which actually it's a nice exercise if you want to think about it. Suppose that you have a, a humming weight ratio of less than one third, you can prove that there are no forkable strings, like with less than one third. Forkable, forkable means that uh, you can find this tree structure and you're going to have at least two, um, we call them tines, at least two of those threads that are string w as wide as the string. Whereas the complement, like not forkable, means that one of the times has, is bigger. So, so eventually the honest parties will converge, let's say, if you wait for, for that long, long enough. Um, so here is good, like it's a kind of a nice exercise to show that it's, uh, it's the humming weight ratio is less than one third, like you can, you, you can get like no forkable strings, but it's much harder to go to the setting where you are between one third and one half. This requires, it's, so there you get forkable strings and their density gets higher, the closer you go to 50%. The moment you hit 50%, then all strings are forkable. So what we prove is basically that the density drops exponentially at most with minus asymptotic square root of n, where n is the length of the string. So basically you, it's 
negligible the amount of the density of forkable strings as you go closer to 50%. And here you can also have a sort of what you would expect from some, some negligible function like that. So the, the closer you go here, like the, all right. So I have another interesting discussion about covert adversaries. Um, so, but I'll, I'll have to skip it. I'll just gonna say a few words. You can define like a simpler notion of forking. It's a forking that you can deny because for example, like this you cannot deny, right? You, if you reveal that you signed twice, two different times, two different uh, forks. So if they compare notes, they will know that stakeholder in that slot was actually doing something wrong. So it's interesting to also ask how much you can fork in a deniable fashion. And, and if you go to the deniable or covert fashion, uh, we can actually show uh, a much better bound. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of an idea about how the system works. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm, I went a bit slower than what I was expecting. I, do, I still have uh, five minutes. Uh, is that, uh, Ali, is that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit. I'm gonna skip forward. I'm gonna say maybe one minute about <clears throat> how this bootstrapping stage works. So basically you get the initial stakeholders, you, you do this procedure with, with the chain, but now you, you would like to let the stake move on and repeat the process. So what happens is that, let's imagine you have a beacon that is gonna create another random value, and you can create now a stakeholder distribution, not by assumption, but by the blockchain itself. So now you can repeat the same process on and on. You get again the leader election process, that's the stakeholder distribution changed according to this. Now you get another procedure like that. The only problem here is where does this beacon coming from? And this is what we can show to solve using secure multi-party computation, but with a very efficient secure multi-party computation protocol. The nice thing about this protocol is that we can use the blockchain itself as the broadcast channel over which we can run secure multi-party computation. I'm not gonna go to the details of this because we're a bit out of time. I'd be happy to discuss with them after the talk. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the incentive structure. So how do incentivize parties to execute the protocol? So in order to do that, we have a concept that we call input endorsement. So inputs, in the, in the case of a blockchain that is used for transaction ledger is sets of transactions, they have to be endorsed uh, to go to the blockchain. So this is an, the idea that we use, and I will explain why this is a good thing. So a sequence of transactions need to be endorsed to be included in a block. And if you have an endorsed sequence, the input endorser is associated with every slot in the same way as the leader of the slot is associated with a slot. However, an endorsed input, an endorsed sequence of transactions can be included in the ledger in any upcoming block up to 2K slots in the future. And this is an essential aspect in our equilibrium proof. So these are the assumptions we do about protocol costs, that issuing blocks is easy, but it is expensive to run the secure multi-party computation protocol, and it is expensive to endorse transactions because you need to verify them. So these are the expensive actions. So we're gonna assume that this is like almost negligible, and we would like to incentivize for those actions. So you have to be rewarded for those. So based on that, we have a reward mechanism, which is very different from Bitcoin. It operates only at epoch levels, and then it provides rewards to parties for being a committee member, committee is the parties that run the secure multi-party computation protocol, and endorsing a set of inputs and sending messages for the MPC protocol. So they get like rewards, which are <clears throat> given to them in proportion to how much they participate in terms of endorsing and sending messages for the multi-party computation protocol. So based on this reward function, we can prove that the protocol itself is an approximate Nash equilibrium. So, and that's in contrast to Bitcoin, where we know that the protocol, it's not an equilibrium. The proof 
essentially, the way it works is that it considers a coalition of rational players that deviates from the protocol specification in some arbitrary way. And it proves that no matter what they do, our properties of chain quality, common prefix, and chain growth, essentially, but most importantly, chain quality, ensures that the parties that are following the protocol will be guaranteed to have all their messages, which produce rewards, included in the blockchain. Therefore, their rewards will not be affected by the arbitrary deviation of the malicious coalition. That means eventually that the malicious coalition might get a, an advantage, but that advantage is bounded, and hence we have an approximate Nash equilibrium, and the level of approximation is something that can be calibrated <coughs> in the parameterization of the protocol. The requirement here is that the coalition should be less than 50% of the stake, and otherwise this whole proof will not work. I have more stuff to tell you about delegation and online codes and our implementation, as well as performance, uh, comparison, but we will have to leave that for another opportunity. So, thank you very much for um, you know, giving the opportunity to uh, talk about this protocol, and also I'd like to finish with an advertisement uh, about PhD and postdoc positions which are now available. We have a number of positions open at the University of Edinburgh, that's Edinburgh, and uh, if you are interested about work in blockchain and you would like to do more work in this domain, you know, go check my website where you find an announcement uh, for positions <coughs> uh, for PhD and, and postdocs. So thank you very much. <laughs>